Hey everyone, my name is Richard Chen. I'm a third year emergency medicine resident at Rutgers Robert Johnson Medical School. Hey, I'm AJ Geib. I'm the Chief of Medical Toxicology in the Department of Emergency Medicine, also at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson. Uh, and here we're going to be talking about common toxidromes and giving you some basic information that would be useful to know uh, in your practice in the future. So we don't have any relevant conflicts to disclose, although if you have anything you'd like me to say, I'll take free food or any kind of payment. I'm equally poor, so yeah, no conflicts here. In terms of the objectives for this lecture today, uh, we'll be discussing uh, six major classes of medications and their related toxidromes. We'll be reviewing the constellation of the signs and symptoms associated with these medications and toxidromes. And then we'll kind of go a little bit detail into the pharmacologic mechanisms in terms of the receptors that these medications and drugs act upon. And then we'll go into a little bit about uh, the basic treatment and reversal for some of these common toxicities. So what are toxidromes? Most of them are included in what the category we call classic toxidromes. These include sympathomimetic, opioid, sedatives, cholinergic, anticholinergic, and then an additional one that's not really a classic but is also good to know in practice is a serotonergic. So a sympathomimetic toxidrome, basically where you get sympathetic upper regulation. So this is what we typically call the fight or flight response. The class of drugs that are normally associated with this uh, toxidrome are known to be stimulants. And you kind of think about the things that happen when you're very nervous and in a, a nerve wracking situation, such as me giving this lecture, and you get dilated pupils, like rapid heartbeat, and those kind of uh, symptoms, which we'll go a little bit more detail in a few slides. So in terms of neuro uh, neuropharmacology, most uh, drugs and medications that are included in the stimulant class, they basically enhance release of excitatory catacombs Cholamine. So these include things like uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. A lot of the drugs also have a function of blocking reuptake of these catecholamines, uh, which then results in prolonged stimulation of the postsynaptic terminals, and then you have the prolonged effect of these catecholamines. So as I was kind of started going into, the symptoms associated with this syndrome include things like hypertension, tachycardia, which in really severe situations can lead to different dysrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, atrial fibrillation. Patients will be usually agitated, diaphoretic, you'll get medriasis or dilated pupils, and then you can also have elevated a body temperature leading to hyperthermia. So very common uh, drugs that are included in the stimulant class, things that you're probably already thinking of, things like cocaine, amphetamines, caffeine, which some of you think or not is still technically a drug, although many of us consume it on a daily basis, me included, fencyclidine, and MDMA, or otherwise known as ecstasy. So when it comes to treating patients who come in presenting with a sympathetic toxidrome, there is no real direct antidote. The half-lives are relatively short, and then the duration action is uh, relatively short. So uh, a lot of times you're just providing supportive care for these patients. If you need to give some sort of medication, benzodiazepines are generally first line. So these basically have a opposite effect on the patient. They help calm agitation, um, will help with any kind of hypertension, tachycardia, basically help the patient relax and then decrease the effect that the release of the catecholamines has had on their body. Generally speaking, you'll usually be treating these patients and admitting to the hospital uh, for further management observation to ensure that they continue to get better. The second toxidrome that we're going to be talking about are the effects that opioids have on patients. So opioids, as you know, are a class of drugs that are often found in pain management as well as in terms of drug abuse, uh, in, in the case of uh, something like heroin. The class of drugs overall causes uh, sedation and respiratory depression. It's important to note that respiratory depression is basically one of the hallmark symptoms or presentations that a patient will have when it comes to an opioid overdose. So it's something that's very important to look out for. There are different classes of opioids. They don't really have any direct bearing on their effect, but uh, just kind of for completion's sake, they're synthetic, natural, and semi-synthetic opioids. So these basically are determined whether they are found naturally uh, in nature and derived from a plant, such as in the case of morphine, or something like fentanyl, uh, which is considered as a, a synthetic opioid. 
All right, so in terms of the neuropharmacology, there are different types of receptors that opioids act upon. Um, these include mu, delta, and uh, kappa receptors. Most opioids generally have the largest effect on mu receptors, and they act as an agonist to these receptors. The receptor's functions in the body is generally pain control, and they're found in various locations, um, specifically in the spinal cord. They can, they're also found in the gut. And so the, their locations kind of make sense when you think about their effects. Because opioids are agonists, they basically lead to overstimulation of these receptors, which then lead to hyperpolarization of the affected nerve cells, which then in turn results in decreased depolarization, and then the receptors become less uh, sensitive to, I guess in this situation, the pain stimulation. Say you have a patient that presents that you're concerned for possible overdose of an opioid. Typical signs and symptoms would be CNS depression. So these patients will be difficult to arouse. Uh, they'll be very lethargic. Um, they won't be really talking much. They'll have pinpoint pupils or meiosis, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with that. It's a very common presentation and thing that's associated with uh, opioids. And then, as I had mentioned, the hallmark for opioid toxicity or overdose is decreased respiratory rate, and then you get shallow breathing. So in turn, this will re result in a lower pulse ox for the patient. And the reason why we consider this to be a hallmark is because it has a very significant impact on a patient's clinical status. Things like CNS depression, meiosis, those can kind of be generally managed in a uh, not as emergent um, manner, but when it comes to a patient not breathing enough and not getting enough oxygen, that obviously has very severe implications. Additionally, I'm gonna comment that meiosis is a common finding in opioid toxicity. However, it is not the universal finding. There are some opioids that do not cause meiosis. Additionally, if a patient has taken more than one xenobiotic, they may have sort of a mixed effect on the pupil. So it's not the most reliable finding. Again, respiratory depression is the most clinically significant, the most important to the patient's survival, and the hallmark of opioid toxicity. That is a very good point. Um, and it's important to remember that when patients come in with an uh, overdose, it, there's nothing to say that they didn't take multiple things. And even though we're talking about these things kind of in, in separate contexts, it's very, very likely that a patient could come in and could potentially take in both an opioid and something like a stimulant. In severe cases of uh, opioid overdose, you can get hypothermia and hypotension, but these are patients that have either ingested a good amount of a stronger opioid, so something like fentanyl, or have taken a very large amount of something like heroin or morphine. So when it comes to treating opioid toxicity and overdose, as many of you have already familiar with, there's a medication called naloxone. This is something that's become very, very commonplace. People can obtain it very easily because of the impact that opioids, particularly heroin abuse, has had on society. Police officers carry it, EMS carries it, and it basically acts as um, a reversal agent for opioids. So they are a mu antagonist, and a uh, usual dose is somewhere between 0.4 milligrams IV uh, or 2 milligrams intranasal. So these doses are kind of where you start, and you generally will titrate the dosage to the patient's respiratory status. Uh, you don't want to completely get them out of their opioid-induced state, as you could A, throw them into withdrawal, which besides having now an agitated patient that may be more difficult to control, there is a possibility that that withdrawal that you induced using Narcan could potentially be life-threatening. Um, it's important that, to note that the doses that I mentioned are to start, depending on what a patient took and how long ago it was, they may require more doses of naloxone or Narcan uh, because the opioid they took might have a longer half-life. Uh, naloxone also has a half-life and a, it may wear off before the patient is completely cleared uh, that respective opioid from their body. Sedatives are a group of medications that uh, basically, a as a whole, act by GABA agonism in the brain and they can cause CNS depression. And they can in some ways look similar to opioids, but they, again, they do act on a different receptor. They act on the GABA receptor rather than the opioid receptor. The benzodiazepines are probably the most commonly used clinically, and out of drugs of abuse in this category, they are the more commonly abused Alcohol also acts as a GABA agonist and can be considered a sedative.
So looking at some of the neuropharmacology, uh, like I mentioned, uh, sedative hypnotics tend to act at the GABA-A receptor, and you see that there on the right, it's a, a pentameric uh, five-chain structure. Agonism at this receptor leads to actually inhibition in the central nervous system, uh, specifically in the limbic system, motor neurons, and dorsal horn. And benzodiazepines also can increase GABA-A activity by positive allosteric modulation, basically meaning uh, they act not just on a specific receptor site, but also away from that, that actual effector site. So symptoms of the uh, sedative hypnotic toxidrome include severe lethargy or somnolence, decreased responsiveness to stimuli, a quote-unquote normal vital sign coma uh, when benzodiazepines are the only drug that's taken. So in a pure benzodiazepine ingestion, you will see depressed mental status with normal vital signs. In combination with other drugs, such as opioids, you may see respiratory depression, and in fact, there's an additive or even a synergistic effect there. You'll see hypotension. You may see coma, complete unresponsiveness, Common benzodiazepines include alprazolam or Xanax, clonazepam or clonopin, lorazepam or Ativan, diazepam or Valium, and midazolam or Versed. Treatment is generally supportive. There is an antidote called flumazenil, um, and how this acts is basically it is a competitive antagonist at the GABA-A receptor, at, specifically at the the benzodiazepine binding site. Often it's not given because there is a concern about inducing withdrawal seizures, especially in patients who are chronically benzodiazepine dependent. However, you may wanna consider it in children or if a benzodiazepine is given for, for instance, conscious sedation and the patient's over sedated. So in those who are uninitiated, such as children or in uh, iatrogenic situations. Moving on to cholinergic poisoning. This is caused by an excess of acetylcholine. Typical agents causing cholinergic poisoning are pesticides or nerve agents. And this basically leads to an exaggerated parasympathetic response or the rest and digest phase of your life. So you see here that multiple organs are affected. Receptors include the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in skeletal muscle muscarinic acetylcholine receptors in the central nervous system, heart, exocrine glands, and smooth muscle. And most agents work by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase. Uh, so that leads to an increase in acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction or in the synapse and leading to overstimulation of the acetylcholine receptor. Some organophosphate pesticides also undergo aging, which means that they permanently bind to the acetylcholinesterase, and that can lead to a prolonged toxidrome. Basically, the mnemonic you want to remember for uh, the acetylcholine or cholinergic excess toxidrome includes dumbbells, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bradycardia, bronchorrhea and bronchospasm, emesis, lacrimation, lethargy, and salivation. And uh, the comment at the top, the title says, ah, the bees. Remember that the killer bees are your main resuscitation endpoint and your main life threats. Bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm are what's going to kill a patient with this toxidrome. No, I, was, I just wanted to say that my out of these two mnemonics, I prefer the sludge and the killer bees. Because as Dr. Guyab had mentioned, the killer bees are the things that will kill your patient. So it's, uh, I think that the second memory device is more helpful because it emphasizes uh, the bradycardia, the bronchorrhea, and the bronchospasm that could lead to your patient potentially dying from the, the cholinergic poisoning. Thanks, Rich. Common agents causing the cholinergic toxidrome include pesticides such as malathion. Carbamates are a different category of acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and those include uh, some medicinally important carbamates such as physostigmine or neostigmine, which we use in the medical setting, but also could include a pesticide called trace pesitos. Um, additionally, denepazil is used for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, 
and therapeutically it increases a cholinergic tone. Nerve agents or weapons of mass destruction include soman, sarin, and VX gases. So before we move on, I want to point out that this movie, I don't know how many of you are familiar, it's called The Rock, basically starred in Nicolas Cage and the plot kind of occurred around this, these uh, weapons of mass destruction, basically VX gas uh, and uh, ballistic missiles. And so uh, in this, uh, we're kind of going to go into it into uh, talking about the treatment, but in the movie, uh, Nicolas Cage, he ends up getting exposed to the VX gas and he stabs himself with a giant needle with atropine. If you haven't seen this movie, you should definitely check it out. It's a classic. So how do we stop those killer bees? Your initial treatment, as Rich mentioned, is with atropine. And the reason for that is because atropine reverses the killer bees. Now, how much atropine do you give? You need a lot. ACLS dosing a milligram, two milligrams, three milligrams is probably not going to suffice to reverse the killer bees. So some patients need hundreds of milligrams. In the poison center in Newark, uh, there is a display case full of about 400 vials of atropine, which was the required amount to treat one organophosphate exposure that they had. So that being said, the dosing can vary depending on how much the patient has had, how severely poisoned they are, and what agent they're exposed to. But just bear in mind, you're going to need all the atropine. You may even require an infusion, and your goal of treatment, again, depends on reversing those killer bees. So you want to dry those secretions, reverse the bradycardia, if a patient is seizing, uh, that should be treated with benzodiazepines. And then the next antidote to reverse the cholinergic toxidrome would be pralidoxime, which helps to prevent aging that permanent bonding of an organophosphate to the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. All right, so the next toxidrome that we're going to talk about is the anticholinergic uh, toxidrome. So as you had imagined, this is the opposite of the cholinergic toxidrome. The drugs and uh, toxins that are associated with this toxidrome act by blocking the action of acetylcholine at muscarinic receptors, um, both peripherally and centrally. A lot of the toxins that cause this are found in nature. And then there are a wide number of drugs and medications that have anticholinergic effects, whether they're the primary effect or the, the sec uh, potential secondary effect. So this is a really important toxidrome to kind of keep in mind and also consider when you ever see patients on the medications that will kind of go into a little bit detail later on. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the effects are opposite of uh, cholinergic poisons. So you have the same receptor, same system, but the effects are basically opposite. Instead of causing a overstimulation with acetylcholine, it basically blocks acetylcholine, preventing the binding of that neurotransmitter to any postsynaptic receptors. So as a result, you have the effects on the same systems, but you uh, end up uh, affecting salivary glands, GI tract, sweat glands, and the eyes. And if we had look at the memory tool used to remember the effect of uh, anticholinergic toxins, uh, but you basically have blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter, hot as a hare, dry as a bone. And it basically describes the different effects that uh, anticholinergic poisons have on the body. So when you talk about blind as a bat, you get the dilated pupils, so the patient can't focus on things as well, so that's why they can't see as well. You get red as a beet, so you have dry skin and flushing. Uh, Matt as a hatter, noting the altered mental status that a patient will have when they get exposed to these kind of toxins. Hot as a hair, describing the hypothermia that the patient may suffer. And then dry as a bone, where you get the dry mucous membranes. As I mentioned, there are a wide variety of medications and drugs that are implicated in anticholinergic syndrome. Obviously, these could include drugs that have a direct anticholinergic effect. So these include Parkinson drugs, antiemetics, Medriotics, uh, which basically are used for eye exams to dilate the pupil, and the antispasmodics. Other drugs that are commonly seen in practice that don't necessarily have a primary anticholinergic effect but could have this kind of effect in higher doses are things like antihistamine, so your Benadryl, probably the most common thing that most uh, people are familiar with in terms of antihistamines, uh, antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics, various herbal supplements, as well as anti-diarrheal medications. So, as you'll see, there's a very common theme when it comes to a lot of these toxidromes. Care is largely supportive. 
Um, there really a lot of times is not very good reversal agent or antidote to treat a lot of these toxidromes. We want to make sure that we protect patient's airway, treat any kind of agitation, seizures with benzodiazepines. A medication that is a, I guess, reversal agent, if you will, which you saw this listed as a potential cause of cholinergic poisoning is physostigmine. And it kind of makes sense because they're in opposite classes. So uh, just as atropine is used for reversal of cholinergic poisoning, physostigmine could potentially be used for uh, reversal of anticholinergic poisoning. The important thing to note though is that physostigmine is a little controversial in terms of its use in practice, so it's not very common because there have been some case reports that physostigmine could potentially cause seizures in patients who have overdosed on tricyclics, as well as causing potential arrest in a systole. And so TCAs, not as common in treatments of depression and stuff today, but still used when patients have things like uh, migraines and headaches or nerve pain from chronic pain. Um, so that you still will see these types of medications, so it's important to always consider them, especially if you see it that the patient comes in and you see that they have a TCA on their, on their medication list. This emphasizes why getting a good history before you treat. Um, so we kind of just went over, I guess, the first five toxidromes, they, which is what we consider the classic toxidromes. This sixth one that we're going to talk about is not really a classic, but it's an important one to know. So I'm going to have, uh, let Dr. Guy kind of uh, chime in and talk about uh, this important situation. So getting into the serotonin syndrome, uh, this is an important toxidrome to recognize, especially in light of all the commonly used medications that could trigger this. It's often associated with the use of psychiatric medications, particularly serotonergic antidepressants, SSRIs. It results from an excess of serotonin in the central nervous system, and in some ways may appear similar to the neuroleptic malignant syndrome in its presentation. It is typically triggered by a combination of serotonergic medications. The receptors involved include the 5-HT1A, and 5-HT2A receptors, especially in the central nervous system. There are some peripheral serotonergic receptors that are not so associated with serotonin syndrome, however. They're responsible for various effects throughout the brain. Serotonin is very much a modulator of neurologic function. Serotonin is associated with thermoregulation, behavior, and regulation of neuronal networks in the brain and spinal cord. Serotonin syndrome is characterized by a triad of cognitive, autonomic, and neuromuscular effects. Patients will present with altered mental status, hyperthermia in severe cases, muscle rigidity, hyperreflexia and tremors, sympathetic effects such as increased heart rate and increased blood pressure, and myoclonus, which is probably the most important distinguishing exam finding. I actually have a quick question, Dr. Guy. So we, I guess we had mentioned uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome earlier. So I remember reading that there's a, a lot of similarity between those two syndromes. How could we potentially differentiate those two syndromes from each other? Because uh, from my understanding, NMS also has kind of the muscle rigidity, altered mental status. Uh, they could also be potentially hyperthermic and also having kind of similar sympathetic effects. So how can we tell? The first thing I'm gonna look at is the patient's medication list and try to get a proper history of exposure. So if a patient is on primarily antidepressants or more than one antidepressant, or they've added on something new such as a second antidepressant or even linazolid or an MAO inhibitor, I'm going to favor serotonin syndrome. If the patient is on antipsychotics or dopamine antagonists, I'm more likely going to favor NMS. The other thing is that NMS tends to be more gradual onset and tends to be sometimes triggered by medical illness, whereas serotonin syndrome tends to be more acute in onset, onset within hours rather than days, and um, is triggered often by an overdose or quickly adding a new medication to the regimen. The third thing is that with regard to the muscle rigidity, NMS tends to have more lead pipe type of rigidity whereas the rigidity in the serotonin syndrome tends to preferentially 
affect the lower extremities, tends to be more clonic in nature, and that's the main distinguishing factor. So basically, history and physical exam. That's correct. Like I touched on before, uh, medications associated with serotonin syndrome include the SSRIs, such as sertraline, uh, the SNRIs, like venlafaxine or duloxetine, tricyclic antidepressants, like amitriptyline, MAO inhibitors, such as phenylzine or tranylcypramine. Yes, we still use them, and I probably get a case or two of this a year. Other medications that may be associated include lithium, tramadol, which uh, actually is you know, marketed as an opioid but has a lot of serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake blockade, sumatriptan, which is an anti-emetic, and f surprising, fentanyl and cocaine, uh, so drugs of either therapy or abuse. So what's the treatment for serotonin syndrome? First and foremost, discontinue the offending medications. Of particular importance is that if I suspect a patient is at risk for serotonin syndrome and they are intubated in the medical ICU, I will suggest that the, the treating team not use fentanyl because this could worsen or even trigger a serotonin syndrome unintentionally. Again, most good toxicology treatment is good supportive treatment. Patients may need to be intubated and put on ventilator support to achieve proper uh, sedation. Benzodiazepine sedation is probably your first line. You can consider ciproheptadine. Ciproheptadine is an antihistamine that has 5-HT1A antagonist properties and may be used as an adjunct. The downside to using ciproheptadine is that you can only give it by mouth. So it's difficult to titrate, and if you have a patient who is altered, you know, it may not be the safest medication to use in them. So again, your first line treatment is benzodiazepines and consider ciproheptadine as an adjunct, although it's certainly not required. So we finished talking about basically six important toxidromes to know for your future practice. So what I'm going to kind of do real quick is uh, go through each of these and kind of give you two clinical pearls that out of all the stuff we talked about are probably the most important for those particular toxidromes. So for sympathetic, the presentation, you get the fight or flight response. So you have the sympathetic upregulation, uh, the tachycardia, hyperthermia, agitation, and benzodiazepines are your first line for treatment. And that treatment is basically supportive. For opioids, Respiratory depression, again, is a key effect to pay attention to because if the patient's not breathing well, they're not gonna oxygenate well, and that never bodes well for anybody. And then naloxone to reverse opioids. And you always titrate this to respiratory effort and respiratory rate, and try not to go too much further than that. For sedatives, when a patient comes in, they may have a what we call a normal vital sign coma if the benzodiazepine is able to be confirmed to be the only thing that was taken. But in the context of other medications or in combination with other medications, it could present with uh, more severe effects like hypotension, uh, respiratory depression. Flumazenil is an antidote for benzodiazepines, but reversal must be done with caution. Remember, we want to avoid giving this medication to people who are chronically on benzodiazepines or chronically dependent, because when you give it to a patient who's been chronically on benzodiazepines, you could potentially cause seizures or withdrawal. And as you know, withdrawal that's due to benzodiazepines and uh, similarly alcohol can be very life-threatening. Um, but you want to always keep this treatment in the back of your head for smaller children who may have overdosed or patients who are giving medication in the hospital that may need reversal. For cholinergic poisoning, so and remember the killer bees, you know, the bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm. Those are the three things that are gonna kill your patient. Um, so you always wanna remember those. If, if you're gonna remember anything out of this syndrome, the killer bees are the most important. And then atropine, atropine, atropine. You basically will give this patient atropine until their secretions are dry and that their, the bradycardia and, and the potential bronchospasm appear to be resolved. But the bronchorrhea is usually the easiest thing to titrate to. When it comes to anticholinergic, it's important to remember that there are so many drugs that can have this effect in overdose. The anticholinergic effect doesn't have to be the primary effect for the medication to be clinically important. And in the case of uh, toxicology, a lot of these patients who come in will 
have potentially taken more than what they're prescribed or what the American dosing is. So uh, these kind of effects will be more apparent. And the treatment is generally supportive care. And then last but not least, the serotonergic syndrome. So Clonus is, the, is an important exam finding. It basically helps differentiate serotonin syndrome from uh, NMS. And the first step treatment is to stop the medication and then not give any further medication that could potentially have similar effects. So we'll kind of quickly just go over a, a case to kind of help set your mind in terms of the way you maybe should be approaching a patient that comes in that uh, may have particular symptoms. Because I am a emergency medicine physician, we're going to be in the ED. For this case, we have a 20-year-old female. She presents to the emergency department because she's been altered, which is something that does not un is not very uncommon in the emergency department. Uh, patient is brought in by EMS. Her their initial vitals, she has a she's tachycardic, heart rate of 140. She's hypertensive, 175 or 82. She's breathing kind of fast uh, at a rate of 30, but she st seems to be satting okay. There doesn't appear to be any concern for that at this moment. Patient's really super agitated, not really giving much of history. No matter how you try asking them, they, they would just won't give you any, any, any information. EMS uh, says that when they found the patient, uh, I guess they were called by family because they found the patient really super agitated and they found that there was some drug paraphernalia kind of around the patient. Some little baggies, potentially maybe some white powder, a couple of needles here and there. Because we can't get, really get much information, we do a physical exam, patient's diaphoretic, pupils are dilated, and she's, again, super agitated. As we mentioned earlier, clonus is a really important thing to potentially check in a patient that you're concerned for overdose. This patient didn't have any clonus on the exam. So what do we want to do? How do we figure out what's going on? So that's an interesting case, Rich. So what I'm noticing first is that she's being brought in for altered mental status, and there's very little history, except possibly that there's drug paraphernalia at the scene. I noticed that her heart rate's elevated, and when I see that, I think of either anticholinergic or sympathomimetic toxicity. Additionally, I note that her blood pressure is pretty high, too. She's 175 over 82. She's breathing fast, so it seems like she's pretty revved up. You're describing that she's very agitated and really can't give much of a history. And again, when I see agitated delirium, I think of anticholinergic or I think of sympathomimetic. So then I'm going to go on to look at other exam findings. And uh, you mentioned that she's diaphoretic and she has dilated pupils. So diaphoresis makes me think of cholinergic, actually, or sympathomimetic toxicity. So then I'm going to go back to the vital signs and the rest of the exam. Her pupils are dilated and midriasis may be caused by sympathomimetic toxicity. And you note that there's no clonus on the examination. So that kind of rules out serotonin syndrome as well. So how am I going to treat her? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure she has an intact airway and she's breathing well. I'd probably start an IV and, and start a fluid bolus because probably with all this agitation and diaphoresis, she may be somewhat volume depleted. And then probably what I'm going to do is give her some sedation to keep her calm, keep her safe and keep her from hurting herself and hurting others, all this continued agitation may lead to rhabdomyolysis, which could prolong the hospital stay and lead to renal failure and other, other difficulties. So then probably what I'm going to do to sedate her is give her some benzodiazepines and escalate that, titrate that to effect. And my goal would be to get her calm and cooperative. I don't necessarily need her snowed, but I would want her calm, cooperative, and you know, in a state that she's not going to hurt herself any further. So my best estimation is that she probably injected cocaine or amphetamine, so sympathomimetic, and I would treat her accordingly with good supportive care and sedation. What were you thinking, Rich? So I agree. The case is was a get at that the patient was on potentially overdose on some sort of stimulant. So think about how uh, Dr. Guy approached the case in terms of looking at the vitals and looking at the physical exam and basically looking at the little pieces of the puzzle and trying to put them together into something that makes sense. 
we talked about six toxidromes today. And so when the patient first comes in, they're agitated. So you got altered mental status. So you think about the toxidromes that potentially cause that, which are all of them. Um, so that in itself doesn't necessarily help. Then you look at their vitals and you see that they're what looks like a sympathetic upregulation. So they're tachycardic, hypertensive. We'll just say that she was probably a little bit hypothermic uh, as well. Uh, maybe she had like a temp of like 99 or like 100. And then she's also breathing fast, but she seems to be uh, satting okay. So looking at just the respiratory rate itself, very unlikely this patient overdosed on an opioid because they're tachypnic and not bradyneptic. And looking at what this potentially could be of the upregulation, so you're thinking about anticholinergic uh, stimulants or sympathetic, I would say that serotonergic you couldn't necessarily rule out just with the vital signs because they may also have a kind of sympathetic upregulation as well. And then uh, cholinergic, unlikely, and uh, sedatives, also unlikely, given that she's very agitated and, and not so much unresponsive. So you kind of, based on just the initial presentation and thinking about the vitals, you already have narrowed it down to three of the toxins we talked about. So now the next important thing is to do your physical exam. So then as, I, as the case I mentioned, she was some di say it's diaphoresis, she was uh, pupils were dilated, she was agitated. So if you think about what, what makes sense out of the three toxidromes that we're talking about. And so in this situation, she is diaphoretic. So she can't be anticholinergic because anticholinergic, she's going to have the, remember the mnemonic, dry as a bone, dry mucous membranes, dry skin. Um, so you're narrowed down to serotonergic and sympathetic. So then on exam, didn't find any clonus. So as Dr. Guy mentioned, that kind of basically rules out that it was potentially serotonergic syndrome. So now you're left with one is this the sympathetic syndrome. It's important to know that in a lot of these situations, you may not know the uh, drug or toxin that a patient had ingested. And it's more important to recognize the toxidrome that uh, they're presenting with uh, because you don't necessarily need to know the drug that a patient took to treat them. I hope you guys found this lecture helpful. I had a reference slide you have any questions, we'd be glad to go into more detail about the stuff that we talked about today. And thank you for your attention. We hope that we uh, have provided you with some important information.